Live everywhere. Daily Co's Radio on NetWorksRadio.com presents David Walker. Negro in the morning show. Now, here's David Waldman. Hey, good morning, everybody. How you doing? It is Tuesday, January 17th, creeping ever closer to January 20th. January 17th, 2017. There, that's easier to say than yesterday when it was the 16th in 2017. Uh, no special, I don't think this would send anybody to the store to buy a lottery ticket. One seventeen, seventeen. nah. Uh, you can't, well, I mean, alright, I guess you could play 17, but then what are you going to do for the rest of the numbers? One? What else you got? I don't know. 20, I guess, you could try that one. Alright, fine. Uh, if you're going to do a pick three thing. Do they even have a pick three anymore? I don't know. That seems like an ancient kind of lottery. Anyway, it doesn't matter. All your money is going to disappear on Friday anyhow, either because the world banking system collapses shortly after the inauguration of, or perhaps in anticipation of the inauguration of Donald Trump, or because he will just make it legal for him to take it right out of your bank account and put it in his own at some point. Any, okay, maybe that's a little bit pessimistic. I, uh, I will say my optimism level has gone up a little bit <clears throat> in that, uh, well, I hope that uh, events don't make me sorry I didn't, but uh, I never did flee the country. So that was on my to-do list, and I haven't gotten to that yet, and I think I just might not before the end of the week. So we'll see. Hopefully that doesn't become necessary, and we all are able to survive here in, uh, well, uh, if you're in the United States, I hope you will continue to survive in the United States. If you are not in the United States and listening to the show either live or via podcast, doesn't matter how you're listening. But where you're listening, uh, why don't you come on over and help us out for a little bit and see what you can do <clears throat> to help uh, get us through the next however many years. It seems it's it seems increasingly to me like it it might not make it to four years. We'll we'll talk about why. And in the first place, though, I wanted to start things off once again. Bill in Portland, Maine, uh, faithfully, even uh, even in the face of impending doom. <laughs> tweets every morning and has done so again this morning at Daily Coast Radio is live now. K Grow X, that's me, David Waldman. I say it every day. Are you following along? Okay. Well, K Grow X reports on the new billiards room he just added to his Trump survival bunker. And it's a good idea. <clears throat> Uh, we have a survival bunker left over from the Y2K scare. That uh, survival bunker uh, is a, a, a shelf in the uh, room where our water heater is. That's the bunker. We can't live in it. It's just we call it the survival bunker because that's where we put stuff like spare water and batteries and whatnot. And I guess now we're going to have to put, like, I guess, flamethrowers and uh, who knows what else, gas grenades. I, what do you need to survive in the Trump era? I'm not sure. I, uh, duct tape is certainly always on the list, right? We have a lot of that left, by the way. Did anybody use up their duct tape? Either, uh, well, we didn't have Y2K duct tape. I don't recall that being an issue. It was a post 9-11 duct tape. And uh, I have never figured out what to do with it. I mean, we've used it occasionally. But uh, one, we don't have that much duct work. And so I thought we might use do some off-label usage of the duct tape. But even so, it just hasn't been that uh, that big of a deal. But plastic sheeting... That we used. We uh, we painted a little bit, uh, not the sheeting itself, but we laid it down when we did some painting. We uh, have used it as tarp for campouts for the kids and their Cub Scouts and Boy Scouts camping. Uh, so maybe we need to get back on that list, right? The uh, the post 9/11, we're all going to get attacked list. Earplugs? No. Oh. Is that an idea? Parlio says earplugs. Is that what I should be using the duct tape for? Like just over my ears? Or do I wad it up and stuff it in there? I don't think it would come out very easily. It seems like it might be damaging. Anyway, uh, if you've got any other suggestions for survival gear, let us know. Uh, and I guess email it to me, even though that is going to be intercepted soon. That's another thing we have to sort of think about uh, that has come up a lot in discussions with folks uh, offline. Just the uh, information security issues. This is going to be uh, it's going to be very difficult. Oh, Athena five thousand says uh, her mom still has a Y two K closet. I do too. 
Uh, and some of the water that's in there is from Y2K. Not really. I tried to rotate that. Uh, but it would be a good idea to stock back up again and make sure that we have, I don't know, things. Uh, although this time around the disaster in the offing seems to be the, the kind of thing that either you don't want to survive or you just can't, no matter what you have in your bunker. So anyway, it's just a good idea to have. Uh, we, we've maintained it since then, mostly on Greg's advice. Just it's a good idea to have stuff on hand in case of power outage from a winter storm or what have you. Uh, hasn't uh, become necessary yet, but, uh, you know, I mean, if you think that's, you know, what would be funny is uh, you would have people telling me, oh, that's crazy. Uh, the thing to stockpile is guns. Hasn't come in handy for them either, but they're pretty sure that any day now they're going to need it. Well, okay, it always pays to be prepared. All right, anyway, uh, so, yeah, I've been thinking about the possibility of Trump's next four years somehow lasting Less than four years. Of course, lots of people have actually mentioned the, the, the I word. Remember when it was taboo and you couldn't even say it? Uh, interesting. That, of course, has fallen by the wayside. Lots of people talking about the possibility of impeaching him, um, mostly in order to say, well, these Republicans never will do it. The Republicans in, in Congress just aren't going to agree that anything he's doing rises to the level of Im- impeachment level, surely. And they might not even agree that any of it is wrong. That's a huge problem. I, I think health issues probably are as likely as impeachment as anything else. He's, as we know, I guess he's the oldest person ever elected to the presidency, which was a huge surprise to his fantastic gastroenterologist who had no idea. He was sure that he was going to be the healthiest person ever elected to the presidency, but uh, it was apparently a total surprise to him that he was the oldest. What? Really? Oh, and of course, the fantastic diagnosis. Well, not a diagnosis, but the, uh, what would it be? Is it, is it an osis of any kind? Doctors, help me out. Prognosis, right? Well, if it happens, if something happens, it happens. I think it's going to happen. Uh, I, I learned yesterday. I don't even know. I'm not even 100% sure how I learned it. But I learned yesterday, last night, really, that Trump intends to... Take the first weekend off, you know, and it, it, people take weekends off. You and I do. Of course, we're not president of the United States, um, it, but he's going to take a long weekend post inauguration, which actually makes a certain amount of sense for, for a regular person to say, well, you know, big event, etc. I've been working towards this for a long time. Huge, long campaign, rough transition. Uh, we, we started the you know, way behind because nobody thought we we're going to win, including us. I don't really believe he's been working terribly hard during the transition, but, uh, okay, a lot of anxiety, whatever, a big moment, and you would take the weekend off. But, but presidents don't tend to do that, at least I don't think so, not in the modern era. Uh, certainly not presidents who campaign so hard on their day one agenda, day one this, day one that. Um, but uh, over at... Uh, at uh, Daily Coast, of course, they'll have something for you on this. Uh, I saw yesterday a diary, I guess it was one of the recommended diaries, by Gloria S.B. S- S- S.B., uh, let's see, Santa Barbara maybe? Uh, I'm just guessing. So, or is your middle initial S and your last name is B? I don't know. But Gloria S.B. writing uh, Trump's London Times transcript, what he said versus what they reported, right? I, I picked that one up. Uh, mostly out of interest uh, in in the headline, what he said versus what they reported. A totally different angle on the story, but it was in the London Times, or the Times of London, as they like to say, interview that I learned, we all learned, that uh, Trump said he's going to take a, a couple days off after the inauguration, which was remarkable on two levels. One, of course, the... Uh, oh, uh, remember all the stamina things and, oh, you should elect me because Hillary Clinton, well, one, she's she's deathly ill. She's going to die. She doesn't have the stamina. Okay, the stamina. It's called stamina. I've got it. She doesn't. Right. Uh, and uh, so he starts things off by saying, I need a little I need a little rest from my uh, 35 word uh, oath. And then I went to. What do they say? They've also been 
portraying this whole thing as a this low key inauguration, the soft sensuality and all that, uh, a low key. Uh, uh, celebration, what was it, three inaugural balls versus ten that uh, the Obamas went to. Of course, there's unofficial ones that get thrown all over the place. There'll be several of them. Um, anyway, a shorter parade, fewer performers, certainly. All the performers, who, even those who signed up and, and said they would do it, are some of them now pulling out of it. I understand that the, the, the B Street Band, the Bruce Springsteen cover band, is also out. Uh, I think they're down to like two country acts and the Evancho girl. Uh, and that's about it, right? Oh, and th- what? Three doors down? Is three doors down? I don't know what they are. That, is that a country act? I have no idea. It doesn't matter, really. But, uh, you know, there was, they were making it out to be this low key thing and it's too exhausting for him. He's got to take a break. So after all the campaigning on I'm going to do this or that the first day. He now says, well, I consider my first day to be Monday. Okay, I'm going to take a, I'm going to take a vacation. I deserve it. Uh, not to mention all the uh, criticism. Where is President Obama? Shouldn't he be working? He's out playing golf. How dare you? Anyway, I assume he'll be the most vacationed president ever should he serve a full term. But I'm beginning to think that maybe he's just not physically up to the task. He says he's super healthy. And he's not sickly, it doesn't seem, but he's he's old. He is. I mean, I know we uh, we keep bumping back the age where people are considered to be, you know, elderly per se, right? We'll never know with him. I mean, I don't know whether he colors his hair or not, but you know he's not letting go of that. So if his hair was to go gray, I imagine he would be coloring it. What color? I have no idea. But he'd be coloring it. I, I assume he's coloring it now. And I think he's using Crayola as his brand because <laughs> they just melt whatever whatever crayon that might be, tangerine, and just pour it over his head. Uh, anyway, so he's taking a big break, and I don't know whether, I don't know where he's going to spend it. I don't know. I guess the other level on which this was interesting is our first word of this. He's the president of the United States, right? I mean, our first word of this comes from the Times of London. And now it's an English language paper that's, so it's not difficult to decipher or anything, but he doesn't, I, I know he hates the American press, but not even, I don't think any of his spokespeople even said, yeah, he's going to be doing this. I, I don't know whether they knew. I think he just made it up on the spur of the moment. It, it will be interesting watching him either adjust to the realities of being president and coming to understand that you can't spur of the moment make travel or even vacation plans uh, to leave the White House because of security issues. You can't just, you know, snap your fingers and go the way he's used to doing as a private citizen. But I'm also not, I'm not positive that that gets imposed on him in the end. I think he may just do that and the Secret Service will just feel like they have to hop to it and go. And... And they do. I mean, that's their job. It's just I think it'll be enormously expensive and it will take them some time to work up the courage to say we really need to talk about this and this can't keep happening. And uh, I assume that that Trump's answer to that is, you know, to hell with you. It will keep happening. The more you say it can't, the more I'm going to do it. So you better get used to it. All right. Well, as I was uh, talking this through, I realized I'm not certain that I have any... uh, Direct link. I mean, I, we, we have Gloria's um, diary here, which certainly links to the, the time thing. But I guess I, I wanted to take a look at a piece in the American uh, press that specifically centers on the vacation part. And lo and behold, all you have to do is wait 10 seconds and something from the hill will be tweeted with a nice picture to grab your eye and you'll end up clicking on it. Uh Oh, Michael Musson says, um, I'm moderately impressed that you could say adjust to the realities with a straight face. How do you know I have a straight face? This is radio. You can hear that? I mean, I, do, I, I laugh out loud. How do you know I'm not smirking? I, I'm not. I know. Yeah, I mean, obviously, adjust to the realities. We are the ones, first of all, who are going to have to adjust to this reality. He doesn't do that, as you know. I think uh, we, we also got some feedback the other day in comments in the morning post uh, just one or two, uh, as I recall, saying 
Uh, yeah, the, uh, the, the Greg's label of fabulism was probably the closest to the reality uh, of what Trump is all about. But yeah, okay. Uh, it is difficult to think about. And, we, and, and it's difficult to think that uh, we don't have a video component to this. One of these days, maybe, I don't know. I got to talk to uh, people at Daily Coast pretty soon about uh, the new project and the future of the show, et cetera. So I don't want to scare anybody. I'm not certain how this is going to impact things. And so far it hasn't, because, but only because Congress isn't doing anything. Eventually they're going to start trying to do things, uh, even if they're not good ideas, and I'm going to have to watch them do it. Mm. We'll see whether it interferes with the show, but uh, I don't know. Uh, they might be less willing to part with a show that had a video component, though it's a little late to try to introduce that to save things. Don't worry about it. We'll figure something out. Anyway, uh, the Hill story that grabbed my eye, Trump, colon, <clears throat> don't think about Trump's colon, Trump, <laughs> Now you're, you're thinking about it, aren't you? Don't. Trump, Monday will be day one of administration. It will, of course, be day three, but in Trump's world, he can just command it to be a different day. President-elect Donald Trump said the first order he'll sign as president will be to create, quote, strong borders. It's something he said before, but the promise gained attention Monday evening. That would be yesterday, not the first day, Monday. After that portion of his Times of London interview was highlighted on social media because it included his definition of day one. Yeah, day one, which I consider to be Monday as opposed to Friday or Saturday, right? I mean, my day one is going to be Monday because I don't want to be signing and get it mixed up with lots of celebration, Trump said, according to a transcript of the interview, which I maybe that first quote was Gloria's clue that there was a story in just taking a look at what was said in the interview versus what the Times printed. Uh, you, you get the sense that, uh, think about how disjointed and silly that whole thing sounds. And uh, it's, it's taken a little bit out of context, I'm sure, but uh, what does that even mean? I don't want to get it mixed up with signing and lots of celebration. I guess... I'm going to sign an order for strong borders, whatever that's supposed to mean. And I'm what? He doesn't drink. So it's not like, oh, I'm going to get all drunk and wasted and sign the wrong paper. And so I don't think that's it. But I guess he doesn't want to. I don't know. He doesn't want to be bothered with things. And also he has nothing to do. He has no ideas about what to do. So what does he care whether it's Monday or Friday? So oh, I don't want to get it mixed up with celebration. Sure. Fine. The idea of the president-elect waiting until Monday until he starts issuing orders got attention on Twitter. First uh, would be Jeff Schwartz, who has a handy blue check mark and one of those Snapchat ghosty avatar things. So who's Jeff Schwartz? Jeff Schwartz is an NFL offensive lineman and host of the Block 'em Up podcast. Author of Eat My Schwartz. There you go. So he's a famous dude. Hey, look at that. I might have more followers than he is. And I am not even an offensive lineman. Uh, well, I mean, I would be rather offensive as a lineman, I can tell you that, uh, to the team that hired me anyway. Let's see. Jeff Schwartz says, Haha, Trump is taking the weekend off after being sworn in on Friday. Seriously, can't make this stuff up. That's a straight-ahead commentary there, Jeff. That's, I like that. Writer in residence, Mike Cullen commenting they, they took a nice sampling here after inauguration on friday trump to take the weekend off for celebrations and pony rides and face painting ah oh and you know what the source of almost all of this seems to be the same uh initial tweet there was an interesting pickup there angus johnston who tweets as student activism uh, and who himself sports a beautiful blue uh authentication check or whatever the hell they call it. oh yeah verified uh He's a professor at uh, City University of New York. And I guess, was he the first one to, to clip this, or at least the most popular anyway? Trump inaugurated on Friday at noon, tells the Times of London he's going to take the rest of that day and the weekend off. And he just he clips that part of the news and sends it around. And almost everybody referred to that one. Let's say Insanul Ahmed. Who's, who is that? Let's just, I don't know. He's got a blue check mark, so it makes me think. Who is he? He's a senior editor at Genius. So in case you wanted to read, you know, Genius Magazine, that's something to be, you should let people see you reading that around the coffee house. I imagine there's no print edition, but okay. 
uh, oh, uh, the hill, by the way, uh, in, in the little gutter on the uh, on the left, and it's a good name for the gutter when it, it runs those little, you know, you might be interested in these other stupid stories, not on our site, but that somebody is paying, you know, Tabula, or this one is Outbrain. Katrina Pearson seeking a role in the Trump administration. Just casting about, hadn't found one yet. wonder why that didn't work out for you yet. I'm sure they'll park you somewhere. Anyway, in Sanul Ahmed, Trump really thinks he gets the weekend off? Someone please explain to him it's not that type of gig. And Marcus Mann, who tweets, Trump treating Friday like the first college class. Just grab your syllabus and head home. <laughs> That's about it. The president-elect previously pledged to take sweeping unilateral actions on January 20th to roll back many of President Obama's policies and set the course for his administration. Uh, instead, he'll take the weekend off. Maybe Steve Bannon thinks he can sign Trump's name to those things in his absence. Maybe he just thinks, whatever, call me Monday. Maybe he's just not up to the task. I think he, I think he actually will find, I've said before, I think he'll find the job stressful, but then other people will remind me, well, that's only if he tries to do it. And that's, that's, possibly true i mean he may just have no interest in performing the job and so therefore may spare himself the stress and lengthen his uh you know his long uh his lifespan uh, uh but if he puts himself to work on this the way presidents usually work i don't think he can hold up i don't think he's in that terrific shape and i think that uh uh, and I think it'll only get worse. I don't know what kind of exercise regimen he does, if any. He may have mentioned at some point in interviews somewhere along the line that he doesn't do any. But uh, I don't know. I think if he, if he finds himself really doing the work and bound to his desk and keeping this other schedule, um, and and it, his his personal schedule doesn't include any regular exercise, I think he may – I really do think he'll – run into some serious health problems um, and maybe not make it through, especially if he then begins to take the job seriously and experiences the stress level. I, but then again, being the sociopath that he is, it may be that none of this is stressful to him because he's just not a normal person and, and having the actual answers to anything doesn't mean anything and I don't have to, you know, be right about things or find out what the facts are. So I suppose you could turn it into a considerably less stressful job if you were completely crazy and didn't care about anything, including the future of the planet as a whole or the human race. Man, that's sad. Anyway, uh, so yeah, the, the, the interview was rather remarkable in so far as that was what was the lead of the whole thing. Ah, good luck. I'm going to get inaugurated and then take off for a while. Um, McKay Coppins, I noticed, tweeted last night that he didn't find anything particularly significant or offensive, certainly not offensive in any way, uh, about, his, about Trump taking a vacation immediately. Um, and I didn't really find it particularly offensive either. And I mean... For an old guy, there's nothing really super wrong with it. A guy who's, you know, going to be stressed out and maybe stressed to death by this job, it makes a certain amount of sense. It's just it never made any sense for him to seek this job. Plus, of course, there is the offensiveness of his having campaigned on, here's what I'm going to do on day one, day one, day one, and then we find out, you know, I'm going to sleep in and, and go. And I don't know. Is he going somewhere? Is he going to Mar-a-Lago? Did they say? And I have to read the Times of London to find out what you couldn't tell a, a domestic newspaper. Of course, uh, John Aravos is also spotted because he's crazy and he looks at these things. He spotted that over at uh, Breitbart, which at some level has to be considered a house organ for the Trump presidency. Right. He's just laughing and he takes this screenshot uh, back in, a couple of days ago when the story was, hey, we don't have anybody performing at the inauguration. But that's cool because that's exactly what we wanted. Their headline was exclusive behind scenes at presidential inaugural committee. Trump inauguration to have less pomp, comma, circumstance. I don't know that 
that really belongs in the headline. But less pomp, circumstance, so he can get right to work. That was the spin. We can't get any to perform, but that's okay because ours is going to be a low-key inauguration so I can get right to work on day one and start doing things. By which I mean packing to leave. And I, I wonder, I, I do wonder whether he's, is it a staycation for him or is he taking off and going someplace? I don't know. Uh, let's see. Michael Musson commenting here. Trump adjusting to new realities after intelligence report titled ISIS determined to attack in the U.S. on a weekday. <laughs> No, it's convenient of them. And they might be perfectly willing to confine it to weekdays, too. They want to get the press coverage as well. I don't know whether they think the same rules apply. Uh, I think they've been pretty big on weekends, right? It's where pe- people gather on weekends, really. I mean, you can always hit a workplace, I guess. But all right, I don't want to give them any more suggestions after suggesting the whole podium yesterday. That was a dumb idea. Sorry about that, everybody who's going to be on that podium. So, Gloria SB, I thought. Had an interesting take. I just want to share at least some of what she put together here. Trump's London Times transcript, what he said versus what they reported. And she prefaces it saying, you know, it's obviously it's uh, widespread journalistic practice to uh, clean up quotes. That's common courtesy. And, of course, you want to try and make sense of things. Uh, It does tend to get in the way of a clear, getting a clear understanding of who you're dealing with when it's people like, well, to a limited extent, George W. Bush and, of course, Sarah Palin. And here uh, you'll see what we're talking about here. In an attempt to sound like he knows something about foreign policy, Gloria writes, Donald Trump sat for an interview with Michael Gove, Gove, G-O-V-E, Gove, I don't know, uh, of the Times of London and Kai Diekman, I'm going to guess, D I E. K M A N N, former editor of Germany's Bild newspaper, B I L D, not B U I L D, uh, on January 15th, 2017. That would have been Sunday. Spoiler alert, he failed. You can read the full transcript here, or maybe we should, and I urge you to do so, she says, because the Times' own cleaned up summary of the interview does not reflect his terrifying incoherence or his pathetic, superficial way of discussing international issues. In its news report, the Times highlighted several areas of foreign policy touched upon, not deeply explored. In the interview, the ones of most interest to British and European readers, that would be, here are some excerpts that show how the Times condensed and scrubbed Trump's answers in the lead paragraphs of their news report. Trying to find where the Times got the information for these keyword summaries of Trump's positions is not easy. Clearly, the Times had to comb back through the transcript several times to cut and paste these points together. And that's not easy when the answers are as rambling and as shallow as Trump's. And yes, I know that cleaning up politicians' quotes has been standard journalistic practice forever, but in the case of Trump, it's not just about removing a few errs and ums to help the speaker sound more articulate. Gleaning ideas, and she has that in quotes, from Trump's sentences and paragraphs, those are all bunny-eared, Right? Ideas, sentences, paragraphs. Like, is like sifting through a toxic waste dump trying to find an unused tissue. They won't be in there, of course, because it's not toxic. But it would be if, well, okay, never mind. I think that it is dishonest of the times to make a person as incompetent and super, superficially informed as Trump sound like a normal politician who has thought things out. Maybe I missed something, but I didn't notice that the times and included any characterization of Trump's answers as rambling, using the term wide-ranging as a euphemism for unfocused is not enough. What the Times of London wrote, for instance, by way of example, the first one, Trump will agree a nuclear weapons, I guess two, a Trump will agree to a nuclear weapons reduction deal with President Putin of Russia in return for lifting U.S. sanctions which, by the way, doesn't sound like such a spectacular deal, and Putin is already backing away from. But what Trump actually said, here's the actual exchange from the transcript. The question put to him is, do you support European sanctions against Russia? Answer. Yes, no, maybe. The answer is, well, I think, you know, people have got to... People have to get together, and people have to do what they have to do in terms of being fair, okay? 
They have sanctions on Russia. Let's see if we can make some good deals with Russia. For one thing, I think nuclear weapons should be way down and reduced very substantially. That's part of it. But you do have sanctions, and Russia's hurting very badly right now because of sanctions. I think uh, if something... But I think something can happen that a lot of people are going to benefit. That's, that's what he had to say. Do you support European sanctions against Russia? Blah, blah, blah. Their sanctions, they're hurting. I think a lot of people should talk about a thing. Yeah. Example number two. Because I kind of mangled it in the reading. Although it's hard to read. His, his, his speech doesn't flow. It's difficult to recreate. What the Times wrote in example number two. He was highly critical of Russia's... In, I should read it in an English accent, right? He was highly critical of... I can't do it. My nose is still not... Uh, my, I'm still stuffed, so I don't know if I could do it in, uh, even if that wasn't the issue. But okay, he was highly critical of Russia's intervention in Syria, however, describing it as a very bad thing that had led to a terrible humanitarian situation. Those are some larger words. Terrible humanitarian situation. What Trump actually said is... In response to this question, do you think that what's happened in Syria now with Putin intervening is a good thing or a bad thing? That's a wacky question, but okay. Uh, oh, I see a story just, just went by on Twitter that uh, makes me want to grab a hold of it and, uh, and, and use it for later. So let me at least open the tweet. Now, let's get back to, uh, where were we? Oh, yes, Daily Coast. I remember that place. Uh, where is this, uh, story? Here we go. Okay. So the, the times asks the question, uh, Putin's intervention in Syria, good thing or bad thing? Ready? Answer. Nah, I think it's a very rough thing. <laughs> is it a good thing or a bad thing? Eh, I think it's a rough thing. It's a very bad thing. Oh, okay. So that's an easy answer, right? Is it a good thing or a bad thing? It's a rough thing. Well, a very bad thing. We had a chance to do something when we had the line in the sand, and it wasn't. Nothing happened. That was the only time. And now, it's sort of very late. It's too late. Now everything is over. At some point, it will come to an end. But Aleppo was nasty. I mean, when you see them shooting old ladies walking out of town, they can't even walk, and they're shooting them. It almost looks like they're shooting them for sport. Ah, no, that's a terrible... That's been a terrible situation. Aleppo has been such a terrible humanitarian situation. That does sound considerably worse than just, you know, that excerpt that they provide. But again, what else can they work with? Nothing. Here's another one. What the Times wrote was, Orders will be signed next Monday to strengthen America's borders, which could include travel restrictions on Europeans. Europeans coming to the U.S., as well as extreme vetting for those entering America from parts of the world known for Islamist terrorism. Now, here's what Trump actually said, right? They are the first ones to glean from this that he's not going to work Friday, Saturday, or Sunday. People don't want to have other people coming in and destroying their country. And, you know, in this country, we're going to go very strong borders from the day I get in. All right? This is the setup for all this. People don't want to have other people coming in and destroying their country. That's true. And you know, in this country, we're going to go very strong borders. We're going to go very strong borders. From the day I get in. Now, what about that? From the day I get in. He continues, one of the first orders I'm going to sign, day one, which I consider to be Monday uh, as opposed to Friday or Saturday, right? I mean, my day one is going to be Monday because I don't want to be signing and getting it mixed up with a lot of celebration. But one of the first orders we're going to be signing is going to be strong borders. We don't want people coming in from Syria who don't know who they are. Who we don't know who they are. Okay, at least that's in there. <laughs> they themselves, it's a journey of personal exploration. That's why they're coming here. They know we have the best self-help uh, gurus in the world. He actually does say, oh, we don't want people coming in from Syria who we don't know who they are. You know, there's no way of vetting these people. I don't want to do what Germany did. And in, in another section of the transcript, there's another question in which they ask, you said during the campaign that you'd like to stop Muslims coming to the U.S. Is that still your plan? They have to go to another question just to get an answer, to formulate an answer to the question of, you know, what are you going to be doing when you become president? That, that was all. I'm not going to do anything until Monday because that's the way, and it, that's extensive explanation of 
why I'm not going to be working Friday, Saturday, Sunday, and then something about, I don't know, who's coming from Syria or whatever. So, what about the, the Muslim ban? Well, from various parts of the world, we have lots of terrorism problems. There will be extreme vetting. It's not going to be like it is now. They don't even, we don't even have real vetting. The vetting into this country is essentially non-existent as it is, as it was at least with your country. Uh, okay. And then they have to get an- to another section of the transcript to glean the rest of that. That one simple paragraph, which was uh, on Monday, the orders will be signed to strengthen the borders, travel restrictions to Europeans, possibly, uh, plus extreme vetting. They had to go to three different questions just to get that strung together half answer. The other, the third section of the transcript that they went to was the response to this question. Are there any travel restrictions that could be imposed on Europeans coming to the U.S.? Well, it could happen. I mean, we're going to have to see. I mean, we're looking at parts of Europe, parts of the world and parts of Europe where they, where we have problems, where they come in and they're going to be causing problems. I don't want to have those problems. Look, I won the election because of strong borders and trade and military. We're going to have a strong military. Really, literally, couldn't even put three sentences together on, uh, well, I don't know. I, 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 mean, I was going to say on the question of European travel restrictions. I don't know if I could put three sentences together on that other than to say European travel restrictions. No, uh, we don't really typically do that. Of late, but I guess, I guess everything's up in the air now that I like that answer to. It could happen. We're going to have to see. I mean, we're looking at parts of Europe where there are problems because they have problems because the people there cause problems. We don't want to have problems, so we're not going to let those people who cause problems into this. We don't want problems. Thank you. No problems. That's okay. Good answer. What the Times wrote in another example. He believes that Angela Merkel, or Merkel as we said yesterday, made a catastrophic mistake, that's in quotes, when she left, oh, I'm sorry, when she let more than a million migrants into Germany, adding that the EU has become, quote, a vehicle for Germany. Uh, I wonder how that even came about. But okay, we'll, we'll go find out. The catastrophic mistake, of course, resulting in nothing in particular so far. So, okay. Uh, what Trump actually said, first in response to this question. When Obama came for his last visit to Berlin, he said that if he could vote in the upcoming election, he would vote for Angela Merkel. Would you? Answer. Well, I don't know who she's running against, number one. I'm just saying. I don't know her. I've never met her. Like, <laughs> again, uh, most people don't, but okay. I don't know who's running against her. You could look that up. Maybe get informed about Germany because it's kind of an ally. I don't know who she's running against, number one. I'm just saying, I don't know her. I've never met her. As I've said, I have great respect for her. I felt she was a great, great leader. I think she made one very catastrophic mistake, and that was taking all of these illegals, refugees, illegals, he likes to say, you know, taking all of the people from wherever they come from, and nobody even knows where they come from. You'll find out you got a big dose of it a week ago. So I think she made a catastrophic mistake, a very bad mistake. Now, with that being said, I respect her. I like her, but I don't know her. So I can't talk about who I'm going to be backing, if anyone. And then, from another section of the transcript, they borrow from the answer to this question. In your campaign, you said Angela Merkel's policy on Syrian refugees was insane. Do you still think so? I think it's not good. I think it was a big mistake for Germany, and Germany of all countries, because Germany was one of the toughest in the world for having anybody go in. And uh, no, I think it was a mistake. Was it among the toughest? I don't know. And I'll see her and I'll meet her and I respect her. But I And I like her, but I think it was a big mistake. And people make mistakes, but I think it was a very big mistake. I think we should have built safe zones in Syria. Should just, there you go, poof, they're safe now. Would have been a lot less expensive. Uh, get the Gulf states to pay for them who aren't coming through. I mean, they've got money that nobody has. Would have been a lot less expensive than the trauma that Germany's going through now. But I would have said, you build safe zones in Syria. 
Look, this whole thing should never have happened. Iraq should not have been attacked in the first place, all right? It was one of the worst decisions, probably, possibly the worst decision ever made in the history of our country. We've unleashed. It's like throwing rocks into a beehive. It's one of the great messes of all time. Some, I looked at something, uh, I'm not allowed to show you because it's classified, but I looked at Afghanistan. And you look at the Taliban, and you take a look at every, every year, it's more, more, more. You know, they have the different colors. And you say, you know, what's going on? There's nothing wrong with your radio. Don't adjust anything. I'm just stunned into silence. What I, I guess he's talking about, uh, holy moly. I mean, the fact that, well, one, of course, after the fact, he's now against Iraq. Although he didn't make the strongest endorsement of it, I can tell you that. I mean, even the evidence that we have of him on the radio with Howard Stern saying, oh, yeah, I guess I'm okay with the Iraq invasion. I mean, that's a, that is a yes, but it's not an enthusiastic yes. At least we have that. But now he pretends he's one of the biggest opponents ever. And uh, I guess he's trying to say Afghanistan, the conflict in Afghanistan continues. It goes on and on, and you can never really settle it. We keep having to send more people, although I don't know that the, uh, the the troop levels have really necessarily increased all that much. I haven't tracked the troop levels. Maybe they have. I don't know. But, he, he, uh, yeah, but, but one, I'm not president. And two, I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't go into an interview with nothing more than this. And I don't know what he's talking about, about different colors. That I've got no idea. Anyway, well, let's see. Uh, Gloria sums things up here by writing this to its credit the times did include some of trump's more egregious statements but the times still made trump seem far too close to normal by reporting his statements as if they were those of a person who had actually considered the issues but how does any of this pass for foreign policy thinking of course the main problem is that trump has never thought about any of this unless it had a tangential effect on his business's bottom lines you can tell he's been briefed recently but not a lot of it appears to be sinking in. And what has sunk in reflects, as we have learned, what the last person he talked with said. He throws around the facts that he can remember and blusters and BSs his way through the rest of it. His inarticulateness is, once again, on full display. I'm not, I'm not crazy about that word, but okay. But another part of the problem is that, as you can see in the full transcript, the interviewers served up a lot of very soft questions. Is there anything else you take from having a Scottish mother? Is there anything typically German about you? And when they did ask serious questions, they did not follow up when Trump gave an incoherent or off-the-subject answer. Isn't anyone in the press going to stand up to Trump, call him out to his face on lies and inaccuracies, and remind him to actually answer the question? Is this let him ramble unchecked interview model the way things are going to be? Yes, I would guess so. Both this interview and his previous sit down with the New York Times reflect a willingness by the press to be bullied in advance as a way of avoiding getting on Trump's S list, we'll say. Put it all together, the press's obsequiousness and cowering attitude, the increasing normalization by the press of Trump's abnormality, the incoming administration's threats against the press, plus Trump's obvious incompetence. Where are we going? And an update that reads, I am happy to report that MSNBC's Lawrence O'Donnell read directly from the Times transcript tonight on his show. He did exactly what I had been hoping for, not summarizing or rephrasing, but instead quoting Trump's nonsensical words verbatim. Excellent. Which means, I guess, that I don't have to, although I was thinking that might be make an interesting show in itself but it might eat up the rest of the show if we did do that so we'll rely on lawrence o'donnell's having done so so that if you wish to uh, i don't know if you read the full full transcript how long is it let's just i'm curious i want to take a look uh oh i would have to subscribe to the times of london to do it mm, well that ain't gonna happen i can assure you of that uh, I haven't even taken care of my New Year's resolutions yet. I absolutely intend to do that, and I think I'll have to do it after the show. I figured I'd wait until 
I got to the 10th article with the Washington Post and then the thing would pop up on the screen and say, you know, the part that says, you obviously love great journalism. And I would say, yes, it's been obvious to me for quite some time. I just have not been moved to act on it. But now I am. What can I do to make sure I get more of this great journalism? I figured I'd click on the button, right? I never do that. I never get to do that. Uh, I, I always intend to skip by these things and say, no, this time I I was excited about actually responding to a pop-up ad and pressing the button just like I was supposed to do in the design of phase of this thing, right? Um, And so I I did, I hit that wall today and the button popped up and I'm clicking and the thing doesn't register. It won't go. It wouldn't let me sign up. So I have to go. I I wanted to do it right then and there on the spot. So I was kind of looking forward to that. I will try it on a different device and see if I can make it work. I don't know. That's not uh, probably not necessary, but uh, otherwise I guess I could just go to WashingtonPost.com and I'm sure it'll pop up again, but eh. Anyway, uh, that's too bad. I was really looking forward to responding to one of those things. Uh, finally, a pop-up ad that's relevant to me personally. I like to take things personally. Okay, let's see. Oh, uh, we have a, uh, a comment has come in via email. Let's take a look at this one. Susan Wright commenting, good morning. And, and it, correct, it is morning. It's pretty good. It's okay. How about you? All right. Maybe Trump envisions himself spending Friday signing autographs because he's so great, right? Well, that could be. And he doesn't want to mix signing pesky legislation on the same day. His little hand may get tired. That's true, too. That could be a possibility. We are, we're not sure exactly what's driving this. Holy mackerel. My whole screen just changed uh, in a, a weird confluence. Josh Warren and Justice both just tweeted some large things here, and they and they were hashtagged for KITM. Thank you very much, guys. So it just came up on my regular feed, and then the notifications were I mentioned and the KITM screen. So it all was like uh, hitting uh, the jackpot on a slot machine. All of a sudden, it all lined up. Okay. Uh, what do they have to say? That, that would have been the important part. Let's see. Justice says, I'm not even sworn in yet, and I'm already seeing of Trump's mom on the $1 bill. You got to see this. Uh, Trump's mom's hair. Uh, I, I suppose you shouldn't be making fun of it and all that, but it's a piece of work, what she was doing with her hair toward the end of her life. But you know how old ladies are. They get their hair set in those wacky things. It's it's a It's an old lady thing. It really is. And uh, does she look like George Washington? Uh, yeah, a little bit. <laughs> Go take a look. And Josh Warren, what does he have to say? Remember P. Otis's doctor's note? Yeah, okay, I remember that. He knows all about garbage documents. Okay, excellent. That comes in uh, an accompaniment to, I guess, Donald Trump's latest tweet. I don't know. I haven't, I haven't seen what he's been doing this morning, Donald tweeting. Thank you to Bob Woodward, who said, that is a garbage document. It never should have been presented. That would be the dossier, I guess. Trump's right to be upset, angry about it, I guess, is what the rest of the tweet. All right, I don't really care about the rest of Donald Trump's tweet on that one, but just keeping you up to date. Is he, that, that's not his latest, though, is it? I think I saw that, uh, yeah, there we go. That came from, uh, that's a Sunday tweet. I did see it, though. At the time, I thought that was funny. I liked his use of garbage on that one. Okay, you're right, Josh. He does know about the garbage documents. All right, I want to dive into some of the other garbage documents that I put aside for us to explore. Let's see. What did I open up? Okay, the stuff that happened uh, recently that I put aside and mentioned uh, during the last stream of consciousness. Uh, this one... D, who uh, tweets as D. Abity. I've never really figured out how we want to say some of these online handles. D A B I T T Y. Either D A Bitty, like an itty bitty district attorney, is is how you could remember it. Or D's last name is Abity or something like it. Okay. This is disturbing and disgusting, as it says here. Um, This, a piece from, well, it's got in. Embedded a an article here from, uh, uh, I guess this is is it Bloomberg Finance B O oh, B I what is that um, uh, Business Insider but is that is that not a Bloomberg publication I don't know anyway Business Insider I guess I confused them all in one place Tiffany's the one in Trump Tower 
Tiffany's says Trump Tower is killing our business. Or maybe they're not in Trump Tower. Maybe they're next door to Trump Tower. That That's the problem. So all the extra security, I guess, outside of Trump Tower uh, has killed foot traffic somewhat. And I guess Tiffany's is suffering. I think they could probably stand to suffer a little bit. By the way, um, also visible in this picture with the two, I think, New York City police officers in... Uh, tactical gear standing outside the Trump Tower. You can see a picture of a doorman at Trump Tower. Now, the Trump Tower has um, those, uh, what do they call them? The revolving doors. And I guess there's some doors in the middle that a doorman might open or close. Otherwise, it's very schlumpy looking, to be honest. Uh, there, some sort of like pseudo waiter's uh, tuxedo style garb and the pants, just big baggy pants. He's standing there with his hands in his pockets and this ridiculous look. Uh, he should be uh, upbraided by the management, to be honest. Okay. I don't want a guy to lose his job or anything, but he looks like a doofus. Tiffany says Trump Tower is killing their business. The heavy security around Trump Tower in New York to protect the president elect is crushing its neighbors, as I think was widely expected uh our writer here by the way akin oyadele i'm guessing at the pronunciation of his name sorry akin anyway the luxury jeweler retailer tiffany and company on tuesday said during november and december sales at u.s stores open for at least one year fell four percent compared to a year ago i don't think you can blame it all on this one location though can you management attributed lower sales to customer local customer spending with a decline in U.S. sales exacerbated by a 14% decline at the company's flagship store on Fifth Avenue in New York, which we attribute at least partly to post-election traffic disruptions, a statement said. Well, 14% ding in the flagship store is going to hurt, yeah, I guess. Trump's Midtown Manhattan residence has drawn protesters, tourists, and journalists in their hundreds, interestingly phrased, which will likely continue for the duration of Trump's presidency. However, the extra barricades and checkpoints on Fifth Avenue between East 55th and 57th Streets turned away clients from various businesses in the area during the crucial holiday shopping season. Tiffany shares the Fifth Avenue side of the block with Trump Tower and Gucci. Security at Trump Tower is also coming at a cost in New York City. In December, Mayor Bill de Blasio requested $35 million in federal funds to cover the estimated cost of protecting the president-elect between his election and the inauguration. That breaks down to about $500,000 a day. Tiffany's CEO, Frederick Kumenal, said the company did not expect the broader macroeconomic challenges it faced in 2016 to improve this year. Its worldwide comparable store sales fell 2% year over year. Tiffany's shares slid by 6% in the pre-market trading after the sales update in 12 months through Friday, January 13th. The shares had gained 21%. So not all bad news necessarily, but uh, it's tough when you're Tiffany, I guess, on Fifth Avenue. Well, uh, it's not the worst store to have to have hard times fall on, if you ask me. All right. What else did I put aside? Oh, uh, Yes. Uh, a gun fail story that uh, came to my attention the other day. Got in, oh, and I've uh, started publishing the gun fail weekly comp compilations again, or at least I, I I published one just the other day, covering the first week of the year, and I think I can stay relatively uh, recent. And the goal is to just keep doing this. And uh, not have to wait more than a week or so. I, 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 I'm still a little bit uncomfortable publishing, like, say, Sunday or Monday even, for a week ending the previous Saturday, because there are still so many other stories that come out. You tend to get the Saturday, and sometimes even Friday, gun fail stories still rolling in uh, as late as Tuesday, Wednesday, and I don't like having to update something that's already previously published. But the good news for gun fail fans is that the, the compilations will be back uh, at Daily Coast, and I assume that they might even get some front page treatment uh, like they used to. So one of the latest stories I found very interesting, and I just saw the uh, SF Gate, the San Francisco Chronicle, uh, plus somebody else, 
uh, I think, uh, online presence, and in this case on Twitter, of course, tweeting this story around. This was a really interesting one, I thought. Uh, a couple of hunters down in Texas, and I guess we should use the term hunters loosely. They were on one of those game ranches, which, you know, seems like cheating a little bit. They go shooting, really, more than hunting. Anyway, apparently this is, took place on a uh, a ranch that is bordered by the actual Rio Grande itself. And so it, it's, uh, you know, borders Mexico. And uh, the, the bottom line is it was a gun fail story because the hunting guide and one of the hunters apparently shot one another accidentally. I don't know exactly how it happened, and there wasn't a great deal of detail. Part of the reason that there was not much detail was that uh, instead of the truth coming out, instead, uh, folks down in Texas decided that what this must have been was a cross-border attack by illegal Mexican immigrants. The story somehow began circulating that Mexicans had crossed the river and were trying to steal the RV that this hunting party was staying in, and it erupted into a gun battle, and that the uh, hunting guide who was shot and it was and, you know seriously wounded is in the hospital and looks to be by all accounts in you know pretty critical condition. There were some photos I saw of him on his on a ventilator. Uh, and uh, why is it not in extraordinarily poor taste to be circulating pictures of him on a ventilator? Well, of course it is. But they were being circulated by Sid Miller. Sid Miller is the Texas Agriculture Commissioner, which is a statewide elected office there. And uh, he uh, apparently circulated on his Facebook page the story of this hunting guide and this this picture that was uh, supposed to elicit uh, sympathy and support for him. And it, as it should, I mean, he is injured. That's bad. Uh, but of course, it was accompanied by the story that dirty, rotten Mexicans had done this to him, crossing the border illegally and having a gun battle with our God-fearing and gun-toting Americans who fought back bravely, but he was wounded protecting his hunting party and ought we not all to contribute to his GoFundMe account to help pay for this undoubtedly expensive ventilator. Well, here's how uh, the San Francisco papers, for whatever reason, who picked up this story, have reported it. Brett, wow, what is this name? Barucare, I'm going to guess. Uh, B-A-R-R-O, Barro, B-A-R-R-O-U, Q-U-E-R-E, Barocare. Shall we go with that? Anyway, uh, ooh, and there's lots of pictures accompanying this one. Anyway, Texas Agriculture Commissioner Sid Miller has been rapped on the knuckles before about spreading fake news stories. It didn't do much good. Miller posted a story to his campaign's Facebook page about three hunters attacked by Mexican immigrants while camping near Candelaria earlier this month. It had all the elements of a sensational piece, especially for someone who backs hardcore immigration laws. The hunters, New Mexico hunting guide Walker Daughtry, 26, Florida chiropractor Dr. Edwin Roberts, and Michael Bryant, each, all three of them, wow, suffered gunshot wounds and told a tale. Oh, they told it. I was, cause originally, the way I heard it was they didn't actually say it, but somehow the story got circulated, like maybe locals started circulating it. But it does make much more sense for them to say this, especially if they're embarrassed of having shoot, shot themselves. They told a tale of being attacked in an attempt to steal the RV the group was using. But the Presidio County Sheriff's Office reached the conclusion on Friday that the three hunters shot each other. And it isn't like that information comes out of the blue. Sheriff Danny Dominguez said early on in the investigation that there was no evidence of cross-border attack and such incidents are rare. I don't know if they've ever happened, but I guess they're pretty rare. Of course, down in Texas, they're all saying, Danny Dominguez, of course he's covering it up. Listen, he's Mexican. Dominguez. Wow. Anyway, that didn't stop Miller, 
who has been considered for a spot in the Donald Trump administration from spreading the story. This is why we need a wall and to secure our borders, Miller wrote in a post that was shared more than 6,500 times. There are violent criminals and members of drug cartels coming in, and it must, it must put a stop to it. Sick. Before we have many more Walker Daughtries, we ought to put a stop to whatever it is that's wounding all our Walker Daughtries. It's just not what you think it is. A spokesman for Miller's campaign, Todd Smith, told the Marfa Big Bend Sentinel. I've always found it amazing that you would name anything Marfa, not Martha like T-H, Marfa, and especially Marfa Big Bend with the B alliteration. It just lends itself to calling it Barfa, I think. Marfa Big Bend Sentinel slash Presidio International. That's who Todd Smith was talking to on behalf of the Miller campaign. He told them that family members of the people shot sent the story along with a request to share it and asking for prayers and money. Smith said no one told them the story was untrue and that prayers are still needed. Yeah, pray for the truth. The sheriff's office said the investigation is ongoing, but the evidence and lack thereof points to a friendly fire incident on a hunting trip that went very, very wrong. Although they did all score a hit. That's good news. Wrong, just like Miller's use of the incident for political purposes. Dun, da, 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 I can't believe it. All right. Well, that's sad. Uh, and rather amazing, of course. Oops, a little bit of auto-playing video sneaks in there. Oh, uh, by the way, the video is the Houston Chronicle on 4chan users claiming that they planted the controversial documents about Donald Trump. It's the PP stuff, in case you were wondering. Yeah, uh, we heard about that conspiracy theory early on. So there you have it. Anyway, Sid Miller, statewide elected official, Republican, up for a position, allegedly, in the Trump administration, circulating the fake news that dirty, rotten Mexicans invaded the United States and shot these fantastic, upstanding white fellows. Uh, in fact, they accidentally shot one another. It's amazing. I wonder if they did one shoot the other two and one shot one of the first two shot back. Did they shoot in a triangle? Did they all shoot at the same time? I'd love to know whether they can reconstruct any of that. They're going to do some ballistics testing, I understand, from another another write-up I read about it, just to be sure and uh, demonstrate that uh, the guns that these guys were holding were the ones that fired the bullets that hit everybody. So poor Walker Daughtry, good luck to you getting off of the ventilator. I don't know how serious that is. Uh, Hopefully it's just an initial precaution, and they're going to pull that tube out of there real quick. And he'll be up and back on his feet, shooting his clients in no time. Ugh, what a story. Anyway, okay, what else have we got here? Anything else that we put aside from the morning's session? Uh, I don't know. I don't think so. Okay, let's take a look back in pocket then and move on from there. Uh, What else did we put aside? Yes, okay couple of interesting directions we could go today let's go in all of them because why not we have a wide open schedule today uh this i thought was an interesting this was being shared by i think evan mcmullen the guy is still hanging around he's had a field day uh post-election mcmullen has because of course he's got a background in intelligence and that's playing such a large part in uh well the the hot scandals that have occupied the most of our time in the transition. I think it was he that recommended this on Twitter, and I thought I'd take a look at it. The Lawfare blog, lawfareblog.com. It's come up before. I don't know if we've read directly from it before, but it's certainly been mentioned. I think we've probably read a little bit from it. And uh, if I recall correctly, McMullen was suggesting it, saying it's a pretty good explanation of the, uh, what, what can we say, the the importance, I guess, of e- even this unconfirmed, unsubstantiated dossier here. Uh, and by the way, I understand Putin chimed in either this morning or yesterday on uh, the, the most salacious part of the dossier, the P. Uh, although he didn't address the P directly, he addressed instead the allegation that Trump had hired prostitutes to do all that peeing it wasn't just, you know, him standing around peeing because, yeah, he doesn't do his own work, right? Yeah, I have people for that. And if I have enough to hire him on the spot, 
wherever I go, I create jobs. Right? So I need somebody to pee on a bed in here, and uh, I got some cash burning a hole in my pocket. Why I don't put out? Yeah, don't try to put out the fire uh, in my pocket with that pee. By the way, try to confine it to the bed. Uh, why are the Trump allegations hanging around when they haven't been substantiated? Is the question asked by Lawfare? Oh, I forgot to finish up. Yes, Putin says. Uh, the whole thing is ridiculous because Donald Trump has been with some of the most beautiful women in the world. Why would he need to hire prostitutes? Um, I, a major insult to the attractiveness of Russian prostitutes, I think. But I don't know whether that's going to get him in any trouble in Russia. Probably not. He's going to get away with that one, I think. Anyway, um, you know, why would he need to hire prostitutes? Maybe the most beautiful woman in the world can't be asked to pee on a bed. I don't know. Or he worries about the reaction he'll get. Uh, you know, it's a very tenuous relationship you and I have, Miss Most Beautiful Woman in the World. And uh, considering that you're a pageant contestant in Miss Teen Universe, I think asking you asking you to be here in the first place is very touchy. Second of all, having you pee on the bed, I think that would just be the end of things here. I, I don't think he can ask his pageant contestants to do that. And and I don't know. Maybe I guess he could do anything now. All right. But the more important question, surely is why are these Trump allegations hanging around? Why aren't they? Why, haven't it, why hasn't it just been enough to say they're unsubstantiated and have everybody forget about them? I say P, but other people have different ideas. Sean, I'm sorry, Sean, no. Susan Hennessy and Benjamin Wittes, do you suppose it is? W-I-T-T-E-S. Good Lord. Everybody's trying to screw me up with their name. If I had production assistants, they, I would say... Well, they, they'd be pulling their hair out. I didn't know you were going to go to this article. I didn't have any time to look up the guy's name. Okay. Uh, they answer the question. Why are they hanging around? In a way that I think uh, McMullen, McMiller, McDugan, McBean, whatever his name is, thought was important. And I thought so, too, because I don't know. What is one to make of the apparent inability of press and government alike to verify the allegations in the Trump dossier combined with the cache of documents apparent staying power? The cache of documents apparent staying power? It is a good question. That must be why I picked it up and kept it. Uh, why aren't we dismissing these things earlier? Is it just that it's salacious? And, of course, lots of people pushing back, some with good intentions, some with not such good intentions, to say, uh, what's the story with this? Uh, wouldn't this be an easy thing to verify, right? Like, couldn't we just figure out, well, was he in that hotel at the time? Did he stay in the same room as the uh, Obamas? Of course, he could have been mistaken about that. And was there not any, there seems to be video of everything in Russia. No video of women coming and going from the from the room maybe uh, hopping around outside the room at first and then walking calmly and serenely out and counting money. I guess that's what you would look for in video. Uh, I don't know. So where are they getting this? Or why aren't they getting more information about his actually having been there? Uh, the unverified allegations against Donald Trump are not just salacious, they tell us. They are specific. Yeah, uh, and you might think of that as troubling, and I guess they take a, they have a different view of it. These are facts which should be verifiable as either true or false. Did a meeting take place between the people described at the place and time described? Even if some of the details are wrong, as is often the case in human, H-U-M-I-N-T, uh, human intelligence, are the essential allegations, or some of them anyway, accurate? We now know that the FBI has been looking into the material in these documents for approximately seven months. A large number of reporters have been diligently working to verify leads for nearly as long. What does it mean that currently and at the time of the briefings to the president and president-elect, no specific allegations have been verified? That's a good question. On one hand, the fact that no specifics appear to have been validated should give everyone a lot of pause. At peace, pause. If everyone puts a lot, oh, I'm sorry, if someone puts a lot of falsifiable facts on the table and large numbers of people spend large amounts of time trying to corroborate them and cannot do so, that generally tends to indicate that they are not true. And yet, the intelligence community briefed the president. 
It appears the FBI is continuing its investigation. DNI James Clapper issued a statement yesterday, which would have been a few days ago, reading in part, The IC has not made any judgment that the information in this document is reliable, and we did not rely upon it in any way for our conclusions. However, part of our obligation is to ensure that policymakers are provided with the fullest possible picture of any matters that might affect national security. And I can understand that. This indicates that while the documents have not been validated, the government continues to take them very seriously for some reason. The intelligence community simply does not concern itself with every crazy allegation against a sitting or incoming president that might be circulating or out there in the ether. Prior to President Obama's inauguration, there were all kinds of claims among his critics about his being a Muslim born in Kenya and anointed with oil by Saul Alinsky. Needless to say, the heads of the intelligence community did not feel compelled to alert either President Bush or President-elect Obama about these matters. We suspect Obama probably also never got briefed by the intelligence community about Donald Trump's rumor-mongering about his birth certificate. And certainly DNI Clapper would not have briefed Hillary Clinton had she won on the weird allegations related to Pizzagate. Vice President Joe Biden noted the significance of the fact of the FBI investigation. Speaking to Politico, the vice president seemed to downplay the significance of the dossier itself and noted that for anyone who's been in politics as long as he had been, unspecific allegations about someone's illegal conduct or encounters with women were familiar. But he said, it surprised me that it made it to the point where the FBI thought they had to pursue it. Biden is right that these kinds of rumors, even specific rumors about Russia compromat or on political figures, are not uncommon and therefore not all that interesting, let alone credible, on their own. But FBI investigations of such matters, especially ones that persist beyond cursory initial inquiry, are highly unusual. There is, in short, something significant about the fact that these allegations, given that they have not been validated, are not a part of the giant compost heap of things the intelligence community simply ignores. And there is something very significant about the fact that the intelligence chiefs elevated it to the level of presidential eyes. Why hasn't the government, after some months of investigation, affirmatively put the questions to rest by concluding that documents are untrue? There are other tea leaves in Clapper's statement. He could have, but did not, say that the IC has determined that the documents lack credibility. Instead, he said, the IC has not made any judgment as to reliability. Paired with his statement that these are matters which might affect national security, Clapper seems to be carefully saying that the IC still believes these allegations may, in part, prove to be true, or at least may be closely related to allegations that are true. They just don't know yet, even after seven months of inquiry, so they are neither validating nor discarding. Some commentators have noted that the sole intention of the briefing, oh, in briefing, Trump and Obama on this material may have been to keep the president and president-elect apprised on matters which might emerge in the press. But that does not account for the full story. The intelligence community isn't a press monitoring outfit whose job it is to appraise the president of potentially damaging stuff that may show up in the press without regard for its truth. The job of the intelligence community is to inform the president on matters related to national security. A bunch of lies floating around Washington that might trigger a politically damaging press report does not trigger IC reporting to the president. Furthermore, the intelligence community and FBI both appear to take seriously the credibility of the dossier's author, Christopher Steele. That does not mean that they believe everything Steele says in the documents. Indeed, often even the best intelligence is some mixture of rumor, truth, and fact. Only that he is a person with legitimate credentials on the matters in question and that he has done reliable work in the past. The UK intelligence community, in which Steele served, also shares this view, calling him very credible and lauding him as a sober, cautious, and meticulous professional with a formidable record. Part of the explanation may also be that the salacious allegations and the reports of collusion between the Trump campaign and Russian intelligence do not take place in a vacuum. 
They take place amidst the background of a great deal of public evidence of ties between the Trump campaign and Russian actors. Long prior to the election, remember, media outlets reported on links between Trump campaign manager Paul Manafort <clears throat> and advisor Carter Page and questionable actors in and around Russia, uh, who, among whom I would include Carter Page. Those reports led Manafort to resign as campaign manager and for the Trump team to disavow contact with Carter Page. But of course he came back. Incoming National Security Advisor Michael Flynn was photographed at an RT dinner in Moscow, sitting at the same table as Vladimir Putin and Jill Stein, by the way. I always thought that was kind of weird. Trump confident Roger Stone claimed ties to WikiLeaks and Julian Assange, both of which are suspected of ties to Russia. In fact, the degrees of coziness between the Trump team and Russia prompted us to write a somewhat tongue-in-cheek legal analysis on whether Trump qualifies as a Russian agent. So, but it was tongue-in-cheek, so don't worry about that. But these reports are, at the very least, consistent in key thematic respects with verified public reporting. Significantly, The Guardian and the BBC are now both reporting that the FBI obtained a FISA warrant investigating ties between Trump associates and Russia. Exactly what and whom this warrant covered is still very fuzzy, The Guardian suggested that the target was four members of the Trump team suspected of irregular contacts with Russian officials, though that was later narrowed. The BBC, meanwhile, reports that neither Mr. Trump nor his associates are named in the FISA order, which covered Russian banks, regardless of the specific targets. If reports that a FISA order was obtained are accurate, then that means that the FBI has developed a lot more evidence than just this private dossier on the point, if you believe that the FISA court gives out anything other than rubber-stamped warrants, of course, which is not entirely clear uh, is the case. To obtain a FISA warrant, I guess technically, the government must show probable cause that the entities in question are agents of a foreign power, The precise showing is different depending on whether U.S. persons are involved. The dossier document alone does not remotely suffice for that showing. It is, after all, nothing more than the writings of a single person who does not work for the intelligence community reporting on the unverified comments of anonymous sources. On this note, on this point, rather, Clapper's, uh, note Clapper's careful insistence that the intelligence community did not rely upon the dossier in any way for our conclusions. So, if there is or was FISA surveillance, in other words, the evidence supporting it lies elsewhere. All of this compels us to make a number of observations. First and most important, we should continue to reserve judgment. Uh, I'm going to say P one more time here, but uh, after that I'm reserving judgment. Second, This is a reminder of the integrity with which the press has conducted itself on this issue. Many journalists had possession of a bombshell document for weeks, and while many investigated the allegations, none ran with it until there was something to report, namely the fact that the president and vice president-elect, I'm sorry, the president and the president-elect had been briefed, which was undoubtedly news. At a time when the press is often criticized for running with vapor, it deserves credit on this point. Okay. Finally, the current state of the evidence makes a powerful argument for a serious public inquiry into this matter. There is no real reason why it needs to be an independent commission modeled on a 9-11 commission. The matter could be investigated by existing congressional committees. However, there is a good argument for the formation of a select committee, as Senator John McCain had suggested. The issues here cut across the jurisdiction of a number of different committees and do not fit neatly within any committee's specific jurisdiction. A select committee would reflect the importance of the issue and rightly constituted would be just as powerful as an independent commission with subpoena power and the ability to review highly classified materials. This route seems the most expeditious one to a serious vetting of, as Trump himself might put it, what's going on. So some interesting and valid points there. Uh, I don't know if it fully justifies it if you're a true skeptic of this whole situation, but I think it makes some excellent points. Why is this thing still hanging around? Why aren't we just throwing it in the trash? Okay, other stories which uh, 
I think are well worth sharing. I mentioned to you yesterday the AP News report on the, uh, the claim last Wednesday that Trump made that he would be donating the proceeds or rather the profits from, uh, well, he says foreign hotel profits, but also he had mentioned that the D.C. hotel, if it was taking in profits from, uh, I guess, uh, uh, room reservations or, I guess, uh, catering hall reservations from foreign governments, that that money, those profits, and we don't know what he means by that, would be donated to the Treasury. Uh, Julie Bikowitz uh, at AP had this piece titled, Trump planned to donate foreign hotel profits can't be checked. And that seems to indicate maybe a slightly different take on what the promise might have been, too. Let's take a look at this one. It's a public relations win for the president-elect. Uh, I don't know if everyone agrees with that, and maybe we'll go to the New York Times uh, parsing of last Wednesday's press conference to rebut that. But Donald Trump's company says it will donate profits from any foreign governments that use his hotels, I guess no matter where they are. In practice, however, the public may never know if any money changes hands. And that was instantly what I thought. I figured that that was the case, and there's just never going to be any way of verifying something like that. Ah, Look, by the way, before I move on to this story, I want to uh, supplement the previous one or two stories uh, with something Kate Sherrill just shared with us, a tweet from Justin Fenton. Who is who is Justin Fenton? He is a crime reporter in Charm City at the Baltimore Sun. Very interesting. Okay, Justin has this to say. Oh, man, I thought this was a joke, but there it is right there as a quote in the story. Quoting the tweet of Christopher Miller, who says Putin doesn't believe Trump met prostitutes in Russia, although ours are undoubtedly the best in the world. Big fight now between Donald Trump and Vladimir Putin about who has the best prostitutes, the United States or Russia, the new arms race, if you will. OK, well, very interesting that a, a, a quote in a Bloomberg piece, Christopher Miller himself being a Kiev-based correspondent with six-plus years in the Ukraine with eyes on Russia and Europe, uh, writing for all sorts of places, including Mashable, the uh, Times of London, Telegraph as well. Uh, so uh, definitely an unbiased opinion coming out of the Ukraine, I'm sure. Uh, but Putin might very well have said that. He's, he's that kind of guy. Okay, thanks for bringing that one to our attention, Kate. Now back to the... Uh, the, the donation of profits taken from foreign governments at Trump hotels around the world and how it is totally unverifiable and we're never going to find out anything about it unless it's Trump saying, I've already donated from my hotels a billion dollars, okay, a billion dollars, a trillion dollars. As a matter of fact, there's no deficit. I guess he could always just say that. One, the IRS just said I'm due a $10 bazillion refund. And two, there's no more deficit. I took care of it from the hotels. Thank you. Trump says he's making the move to avoid the appearance that foreign governments can curry favor with him by using his hotels, including one that just opened a short walk from the White House. By the way, before I even go any further on this, uh, one of the reasons he's never going to be able to resolve this conflict, even though he might be, might, 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 if this was verifiable, he might be able to get out from under the strictest interpretation of the emoluments Clause, of course, he thinks he's out from underneath emoluments because this is just fee for services. They're just paying for a hotel room. The room's there. You got to pay for a hotel room, and that's not an emolument. Of course, any of the profit from it, it would be harder to describe that as not being an emolument. But of course, he will simply describe everything he takes in as a market cost and end up donating nothing to the Treasury. Anyway, but. Here, here's the deal. Um, the problem with the whole plan is that even it, at, even if it functions properly and we get some kind of public accounting, if the government of whatever, uh, uh, the United Arab Emirates, takes a uh, catering hall either in, uh, whether in the D.C. hotel or in uh, a Trump hotel in Abu Dhabi or whatever, 
and uh, and Trump then at some point says, "Okay, I'm donating the profits to the United States Treasury." I mean, we're supposed to believe that there's zero benefit somehow to Donald Trump in enabling him to say my fantastic hotel and all of its reputation for awesomeness around the world allows me to write this beautiful, fantastic, tremendous check. And it is tremendous. I'm using one of the big uh, uh, novelty checks, like I, the one I faked up for the veterans that was actually from the Stuart Rohr Foundation. Note. Uh, to present the United States Treasury with this check to, for a million dollars. And all of these photographers here taking my picture, donating a million dollars to the United States Treasury is of zero benefit to me. There's no benefit whatsoever. In fact, I'm losing a million dollars. I'm not getting any publicity or anything. Not at all. No reputational enhancement. No nothing. It's fake, but it's not happening. Right? That That's emolument enough. And it might not meet everybody's definition of what they think of in terms of emolument, but certainly there's something that inures to your benefit and that's enough for me. Anyway, so Trump says he's doing this in order to avoid the appearance that foreign governments can curry favor with him by using his hotels. But of course, it's the very definition of it. Uh, even if it's not me putting a million dollars in your pocket, it's me giving you a million dollars that you can make a big show of giving away to the treasury without actually costing you anything from your pocket. Do you need a huge PR victory? Do you need a picture of yourself giving a million dollars to the United States Treasury? I'll take a room in your stupid hotel. Anyway, uh, so, you know, keep that in mind. Anyhow, continuing with the article. This way, it is the American people who will profit. That was the quote of Sherry Dillon, or Dillian, is it really? Is it Dillion instead of Dylan? There's an extra I in here. Like It's like Billion, but with a D. Get it? Sherry Dillion, that was the lawyer who read the statement, I think, on the Wednesday press conference. A lawyer working with the Trump organization. It is credited here. Uh, she's credited here. As she outlined Trump's plan for his global business empire. Come on. No plan. While, his, while he's going to be president. The hotel profits money would be sent to the U.S. Treasury. We all heard about that. Yet the unusual arrangement left many ethics experts with questions about how it would be implemented, disclosed, and enforced. Several panned the idea as unenforceable and unenforceable PR move. And that's exactly what it is. One key question was about Trump's definitions. I brought this up too. The donations pledge only includes his hotels, meaning golf courses and other properties are exempt. So instead, if I want to give you an emolument, uh, the uh, <laughs> I'm begged, by the way, by Sandra, who says, uh, I like the show, but please, please, please stop doing your Trump impression. Is it is it because it's disturbing or it's because it's terrible or both? I mean, I, it doesn't sound particularly good. I should stop doing it. But there's something about his statements that just cries out for a dumber voice. And I feel like I have to use that because that just I don't want you to think I think that. I mean, it should be obvious from the words if you like the show. All right, I'll try to contain it because it's going to be a long four years. But I don't know. Just sometimes it sounds I, I think it sounds appropriately dumb. I, we should get a different voice. Maybe I should do what I did for him for David K. Johnston, and instead we'll read all of his quotes in squeaky high voices. How about that? All right. <clears throat> the donations uh, only appear to include the hotels, which, of course, means that if the UAE or the Russian government or any government decides, I would rather put that money in your pocket. I don't want you to have to give it away to the Treasury or you have said enough with the Treasury thing already. Just give me some money. We can spend it at the golf course instead. I'd like to buy a round of golf, please. OK, that'll be two hundred dollars. How about this check for a million instead? Oopsie. I, you know. I made a mistake. Too many zeros. And I substituted a one for the two. That doesn't sound good. I'll make it four million instead. And then, of course, there is the focus on profits. Oh, I missed a little bit here. Uh, one, the it could be from any other property. Two, the policy appears to apply only to foreign governments. A narrow description that seems to overlook governments that use a third-party vendor to do business with Trump. That is, it does not apply to domestic interests either, including companies that may have regulatory businesses before the government or domestic lobbyists. And then there is the focus on the term profit. 
Stephen Carvel, a Cornell University School of Hotel Administration professor, said it's not impossible but is challenging and unusual to try to calculate profit on an individual room or venue rental. Typically, that's assessed monthly or quarterly for an entire category, such as rooms, all the rooms, or food and beverage department within a property. It's a monumental task to constantly run this down, Carvel said. Even if the company is trying its hardest and making its very best effort, it will be difficult to fulfill that goal. Through a spokeswoman at her firm, Morgan Lewis and Bacchius, Dylan, and this time it's just with a one eye, so I don't think it's Dillian, that, although I can see where they made that mistake. Dylan declined to answer questions about the foreign donations pledge. Representatives of the Trump organization did not return requests for comment, and a transition official of answered select questions but requested anonymity to discuss the company's internal policies. The official suggested profit from foreign governments, quote, is already accounted for as standard practice for things like competitive analysis, unquote. That means nothing, of course. Uh, countervailing uh, uh, point from Rebecca Romans, who says, I like your Trump imitation, keep it up. So uh, I can probably satisfy you both simply by just, uh, how about if I read complaints about, oh no, maybe that would be inappropriate. I'll read praise for the Trump imitation in the Trump voice and uh, uh, critiques of the Trump imitation in some other voice. Ooh, I just saw David K. Johnston's face go by. Hi, how you doing? Okay. Uh, by the way, uh, Rebecca also had tweeted with regards to the previous, the gun fail story about the hunting guide. Uh, yes, that is a good point here too. That quote unquote hunting guide leads canned hunts where captive animals are picked off by jerks. Reap what you sow. I guess that's right. So we're, we're, glorifying his job by calling him a hunting guide is I, I drove you to this ranch and I'll take you to the place that's uh, on the other side of the bushes from which they're releasing this gazelle from a cage. What a great job. Anyway, don't mean to pile on the guy. He's in the hospital. Uh, where were we in this? Ah, yes, right. The nonsense quote uh, that a spokesperson, was it a spokesperson from Trump organization or the, the law firm? A transition official, that's it. A transition official who came up with this garbage. Uh, profit from foreign governments is already accounted for as a standard practice for things like competitive analysis. That doesn't even mean anything as far as I can tell. Maybe I'm too dumb. U.S. presidents are not subject to the conflict of interest laws that their own appointees must follow, but until now they have followed them anyway to set an example. That would be leadership. Trump is blazing a different trail by refusing to give up a financial interest in his company while turning over the reins to his adult sons and senior executives. The policy is crafted to address the argument that Trump's businesses may not break the conflict of interest law, but does violate the U.S. Constitution. Some ethics attorneys have argued that some of his international work and foreign governments, uh, foreign government guests at his hotel will put him in violation of the Emoluments Clause of the Constitution. And it's not just the Emoluments Clause, it's one of several. The clause prohibits presidents from accepting the foreign one, as, uh, prohibits presidents from accepting gifts and payments from foreign governments without congressional approval. Trump's lawyer argues that fair value exchanges, such as leasing venue space at a hotel, do not violate the clause. No one would have thought when the Constitution was written that paying your hotel bill was an emolument, Dylan said. Still, she said Trump was taking this step to put to rest any concerns. Of course, they framed it entirely backwards so that it would sound like, yeah, that does make sense. No one would have thought when writing the Constitution that paying your hotel bill was an emolument. That's because when you pay your hotel bill, you're paying someone else. You're not getting an emolument. But ask the question of whether or not the, the uh, framers at the time of the Constitution would have thought of accepting the proceeds of the hotel bill as an emolument, that's an entirely different question. And I notice you avoided it entirely. Uh, there is some question, of course, about getting fair compensation for the exchange, a fair value exchange, but that calls everything into question. And that's where the, the real problem begins. Because the same ability to hide behind fair value, 
such a vague concept enables almost anything, both overcharging wildly, which, you know, I mean, you don't have to know Trump that well to know, well, he may very well stand there and justify a $1 million price tag on the rental of catering space or, you know, uh, or, or how do they put it? Uh, uh, venue space at a hotel. Or for that matter, he might with a straight face say, yeah, one of my hotel rooms costs a million dollars. It's very high demand. Everybody knows it's the top quality. It's the penthouse suite. I've stayed there personally myself. That just raises the value already. You know, there's a, the, and just like as he, we've found out in the depositions in the various lawsuits, he, you know, his, he considers his net worth to change based on his feelings about the subject. Today, I'm worth $10 billion. Tomorrow, I don't feel so good. I'm worth $7 billion. Uh, so, you know, fair market value, fair value exchange. I don't know. Let me, I'll put it this way. There is, in fact, a context in which the, in which the United States government, when the United States government is involved in a financial transaction with someone and seeks to pay them fair market value for something which they're taking, right? You know, like since we're talking about clauses of the Constitution, the takings clause, uh, it doesn't prohibit takings, of course. It prohibits takings without compensation to the owner. And it's always been understood that that should mean fair market value. But it's also always been understood that the government isn't looking to overpay in these situations. And very often the people who get the payments are horribly dissatisfied with what they're being paid and say this is far less than fair market value. But the courts very often sustain these things. So in that context... You usually get underpaid. Now, here's uh, Trump undoubtedly going to use this idea of fair market, fair value exchange to try and wildly overinflate the amount of money that's going to change hands here. And that's just that's just backwards. And uh, yeah, uh, I don't think anybody, certainly none of the framers would have thought, as she said, she's entirely right. None of the framers would have thought of paying a bill as an emolument. It's collecting the bill. That's the emolument. And of course, if you are collecting a bill that is wildly overinflated, not only are you collecting an emolument, <clears throat> but uh, uh, then, of course, I expect to see you turn around and tell the IRS and any other interested uh, parties, oh, yes, well, you know, that's the fair market value. That's the going rate. I didn't make any profit on the million dollar hotel room. That's just how much it costs. Now, if I had charged two million dollars, That'd be a million dollar profit. But I didn't do that. I only charged one million dollars. And gosh, it's hard to keep up with, you know, it's hard to get good help these days. It's very expensive. You know how much it costs to clean this place after Russian prostitutes pee in it? It's a lot. I'm still losing my shirt on that one. <clears throat> and you should see what happened to the shirt. Anyway, no one would have thought that the con when the Constitution was written that paying your hotel bill was an emolument, right? Just since Election Day, the Embassy of Bahrain and the Kuwaiti Embassy, and, and it's interesting that they're all concentrated in this place, right? The Embassy of Bahrain and the Kuwaiti Embassy have booked parties at Trump's Washington Hotel. I think, of course, we should put a ban on parties at the Trump Washington Hotel from areas where there tends to be a lot of terrorism just until we can figure out what's going on. It's, it's interesting who's so uh, uh, interested in coming forward with enormous parties so quickly. But, you know, that's, of course, what leads Donald Trump to believe that, for instance, uh, all, all American foreign policy in Syria can be paid for by these states. They got more money than God. How do I know? They keep renting rooms at my hotel at stupid prices. So they must be they're practically drowning in money over there. It's my uh, ethical obligation to relieve them of some of that pressure. Their, their wallets will explode unless I help. The transition official said the company had not yet determined if the donations rule will extend beyond foreign governments to include other foreign actors, such as members of a royal family or government controlled businesses, which is to say uh, it should, but it probably won't because then they can keep all the money. If the Queen of England comes by or Prince William, whatever, comes by 
uh, and uh, and stays there? Should that money go to the U.S. Treasury? It's a good question because uh, it's a weird situation. Is that the prince's money or is that actually, you know, British government money? I mean, it's where most of his... Uh, well, I don't know. I don't even know how this stuff is structured. But certainly, uh, it'd be awfully difficult to argue that the royal family's wealth is not connected to the British government. Of course, they get, you know, paid. There's a stipend to it, too. But they, they do own an enormous amount of property, which I assume earns income itself. But, of course, they own that property by dint of having been the royal family and uh, get, having the, their ancestors having given it to themselves or seized it from somebody else, and that being A-OK under their system because it's a different one. It's a different and weird one. Although, I think we should get used to it, because you might begin to see some of that here in the United States as well. Anyway, uh, but good question. Uh, uh, perhaps clearer example might be, though, uh, uh, Chinese government-operated businesses, uh, where, you know, there's there's no real separation between the government interests and the, the business interests. Trump and his representatives didn't discuss how anyone might know if they're doing what they promise course not like other aspects of the self-imposed arrangement that's largely a matter of faith and trump hasn't followed through on previous charity pledges including a failure to give a promise six million dollars to veterans organizations last year until months later when reporters <clears throat> one reporter david farenthold asked questions about what had happened to the money and by the way it, it just but one of the biggest embarrassments of the american press nobody followed farenthold on this nobody nobody I mean, we all followed what he was writing. No other reporters did it. Maybe they thought he just owned the beat, and he did. But really, the idea that nobody did any of their own work is amazing. Nobody ever thought, uh, has he made other pledges to charity that we should be checking up on? That's rather astounding. Trump did not commit to disclosing what money was being turned over to the government. The transition official believes the donations will be made on an annual basis. The Treasury Department doesn't typically report the details of donations, citing the privacy of its donors. Andy Gruel, the University of Iowa law professor whose position that tr- uh, a University of Iowa law professor whose position that Trump's hotels do not violate the emoluments clause was cited in Dillon's briefing Wednesday. He said the company should take steps to make clear what it's doing. Ideally, he said one of the major accounting firms would calculate profit on the transactions that trigger the donations and report its findings publicly. I think that's an important point to make. Even his defenders who insist that there's a way around the emoluments clause, and I will entertain the possibility that you could construct such a thing, it, but it absolutely positively demands total openness and transparency about how the calculations are being made, and then we'd have to be able to look at the books and say, are the numbers that are going into the algorithm correct? We'd have to be able to audit all of his businesses, and he'd never in a million years allow that. So it can't work. It can't work. Once you've promised to turn over the profits, you have to back that up with documentation, whether you're required to do that or not, he said. Right? Otherwise, it's just BS. I gave him a zillion dollars. Uh, prove it. I can't. Who cares? The end. The government first established an account, by the way, to accept gifts and bequests in 1843. Treasury Department will accept contributions via credit card, debit card, checks, and even PayPal. Oh, God, I can finish out my PayPal account that way. In fiscal 2016, people donated $2.7 million to reduce the debt. An impressive gesture, not really, but hardly a scratch on the $14.1 trillion publicly held debt, according to Treasury Department figures. Uh, wow. So, anyway, like we said, there's basically no chance in the world of ever verifying that this is happening. And so therefore it should basically be dismissed entirely and out of hand. If he says he's doing it, he can say it all he wants. He's not. He isn't. The assumption should be he's not doing it and it's garbage. That should be the starting point. By the way, speaking of the emoluments clause, uh, Armando did finally uh, write and publish the other day his argument about the emoluments clause, which uh, I'll leave for another day so he can come on and discuss it himself perhaps in the near future, uh, and or we could we, or we could read it and then sit, like refuse to have him on. Wouldn't that be fun? Uh, just for the hell of it, 
Mm, no, not really. Anyway, I'd rather have his uh, his input on this. Maybe we'll arrange that for one of the days upcoming. What other things might we try to squeeze in here in the few minutes we have remaining? Well, let's see. Um, hmm. Well, let's see. We got considerably more on uh, some of the other issues we've brought up. Or should we just go in a new direction and say instead... That will uh, add another angle and come back to some of the other continuing stories for the uh, in, in the rest of the week. There's still an awful lot. Let's see. Uh, let's go with a couple of brandy new ish kind of stories instead. We'll go on uh, different angles to fill out the day. Uh, here's one. Um, I mentioned. Did I mention? I'm pretty sure I did. Yes, I know I did the other day. That uh, the uh, uh, New Hampshire legislator who dropped her loaded pistol in the uh, the hearing on full day kindergarten. Yeah, uh, I just wanted to bring that one back up because it apparently has motivated some reporting in the Concord Monitor on the subject of legislative gun fail. I saw at least two efforts at this. This is the more complete of the two, but it's leaving out a number of other instances of which I'm aware. They might not, I'm just not sure of the dates on them. Anyway, the Concord Monitor writes here, gun-friendly state houses see occasional reckless conduct. Uh, and there are several gun-friendly state houses around the country. Not all of the not all of the states that are considered to be gun-friendly inside the legislature actually live up to that friendliness by allowing people to carry their weapons inside. But that's it was sort of a, a joke demand that was made, and then uh, it, it, it actually motivated the, the legislators to say, sure, why not? Let's go ahead and do it. In fact, we, I read something the other day, then I don't know if... Uh, if we have a report on somewhere, we'll see if we can't dig that up. Got to make, now I got to make a note to myself uh, that a, I think it was a state legislator in Missouri who has a sign on his office door now saying, "If uh, if you normally carry a weapon, if you're normally a concealed weapons permit holder, and uh, you don't have your gun with you because we're not yet gun friendly enough to allow you to carry it around." while you're in the capital or the capital city, you can stop by at my office and borrow one of my guns. Or maybe you left it behind because you weren't sure, et cetera. But if you're a concealed carry permit holder, come by and pick up a gun and carry it around with you free of charge while you're visiting the grounds, which is, you know, a little kooky, a little nutty, um, or, and or a backdoor way to compile a government list of the personal data of concealed carry permit holders here in Missouri. Can you believe that? I'm not falling for this backdoor uh, government database garbage. You know, I'm sure you have to show something, right? You can't just walk in and say, hey, yeah, I'll take a gun. They, I'm sure they would, one, want to see your papers. We don't want to be illegal, quite frankly. Why should I even have to show you that I'm a concealed carry permit holder to get one of your guns? And two... Uh, I'm sure that they also would like to write down, you know, maybe a name and a telephone number or something, like in case you don't come back with the gun. I assume that they're taking care of those things. Well, anyway, I just think you should ought to, constitutionally, look, the founders didn't know anything about this. They certainly wouldn't have asked that I give you my phone number or show you my driver's license, right? They didn't even know what those things were. Give me the gun. Give me the gun. And he might just give you the gun if you're persuasive enough. Anyway, that's not what I meant to talk about. I meant to talk about other gun-friendly state houses that occasionally see reckless conduct, according to Kathleen Ronane, uh, I don't know, R-O-N-A-Y-N-E, of the Associated Press, who writes this piece that ended up in the Concord Monitor. Gun-friendly New Hampshire is back in the spotlight after a lawmaker dropped a loaded firearm last week in a House hearing on a kindergarten bill. But lawmakers packing guns on state house grounds and occasionally handling them recklessly isn't unique to the live free or die state. At least 19 states, from Kansas to Texas to Idaho, allow... What, Kansas, Texas, I, all right. From Kansas to... Okay, it makes it sound like it's a wider span than it really is. Allow legislators to carry guns in parts or the entire... Of, in parts of or the entire capital. In a handful of others that prohibit it, 
such as Oklahoma, lawmakers sometimes bypass security measures in order to carry concealed firearms. Ooh, interesting. I've testified in a number of states where I've had legislators show me they were carrying even though they weren't allowed to do so, said John Lott, president of the Crime Prevention Resource Center, which has gathered info on guns in state houses. By the way, none of that info went into his notebook on quote-unquote law-abiding gun owners either, does it? I'm a law-abiding gun owner. That's why I brought my gun here where it's prohibited by law. That's how much I'm abiding by it, you see. No violent incidents of lawmakers carrying guns at state houses have been recorded in recent memory. Carelessness is another matter. In 2014, Democratic Kentucky Representative Leslie Combs shot a hole through the floorboards while cleaning her gun in a Capitol office. Another lawmaker was present but unhurt. That just violates, that, that fits into so many categories. The cleaning the gun while it's still loaded. Um, I remember that one. It made gun fail, no doubt. Okay, that same year, Colorado Representative Jared Wright left his loaded handgun unattended in a bag under a table in a House committee room. Got that one. Right after hearing on concealed weapons, of all things. Hmm. Wright, a former law enforcement official, said he would stop carrying his gun inside the building after admonishment from the governor. In Idaho, House Assistant Majority Leader Brent Crane, a Republican, walked into the press room last year and asked reporters if he'd left his gun there following a meeting. I don't believe I've got this one. Ten minutes later, he'd found it in a desk drawer. All these responsible gun owners who just, why they can't abide by the Constitution and keep and bear their arms, I have no idea. And it's not just lawmakers who have acted recklessly. In 2013, a staffer at the Missouri State Senate resigned after leaving a gun in the Capitol bathroom. I remember that one very well. None of the incidents prompted the states to change their policies or bar lawmakers from carrying guns, but legislators have had fiery debates over statehouse security and who should be able to carry and where. In New Hampshire, the Republican, the Republican-led House voted in 2011 to allow lawmakers to carry guns on the chamber floor during sessions, reversing a policy that required lawmakers to check their guns outside the chambers. Democrats reversed the policy in 2012, but Republicans reinstated it two years later. I wanted the House chamber to be safe, and gun-free zones by their nature tend to be unsafe, said Bill O'Brien, a former Republican representative who was House Speaker in 2011. New Hampshire is one of the state houses that doesn't have metal detectors, and its security guards only started carrying guns last year. In plenty more states, lawmakers have rejected allowing guns on state house grounds, while the GOP-controlled Tennessee legislature tried to allow the public to carry weapons at the Capitol last year. It was Republican Governor Bill Haslam who blocked it. We don't think people should be able to bring weapons in here, he said. This, of course, does not mention, but I know that those in New Hampshire already knew about uh, Kyle Ta- Trasker or Trasker, former uh, state representative, uh, also uh, in trouble for drug use and pedophilia, uh, who dropped his loaded weapon twice, I believe, at committee meetings, uh, and so that might that might have undone my three third times a charm. I guess the third legislator in New Hampshire that drops a weapon might be the charm. It also doesn't list, let's see, I recall that uh, earlier on in the earlier 2000s, I think, a Virginia state legislator also accidentally fired his weapon inside his Capitol office building. And I think he, he fired it into the door of his office and may even have shot a bulletproof vest that was hanging there. I wonder whether it was even an accident. I don't know. Maybe he was testing the vest. Heard such stories before. And then uh, there are a couple other ones around as well, including... Uh, Oh, well, it was a Capitol Police officer who left a service weapon on a toilet paper dispenser inside the Capitol building uh, a year or so ago as well. Various staffers who've been caught in various places by the metal detectors carrying guns, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, interesting and a, a more widespread problem than just New Hampshire. Certainly it's not just the New Hampshireites, let's say. Who are who are doing this one? What else did uh, we want to shoehorn in here before we uh, checked out for the day? Uh, is that a really? That's probably about it. As we're getting to the end of the, the, the times running out, certainly. Um, 
But I feel like there was something else that we might have been able to shoot in. Oh, yes, that's right. Uh, I guess we don't really have to read too far into this one, unless you'd like to, but maybe we'll save it for another day. I saw this one uh, tweeted by Joe My God. You probably follow him, too. I just wanted to throw this in here, just because we I don't think we spoke enough today about urine and, and the Trump pee situation. I just thought this was an interesting find. Trump urine. Really? That's not what they called it. But Trump urine, another failed scam company. This goes all the way back to March of last year, and I guess uh, it, it became relevant again over at the Joe My God blog. And Joe My God, it's true, there's really something else. Among the many failed companies run by Donald Trump was a Ponzi scheme vitamins distributorship, which analyzed customers' urine samples and sent them a list of the essential nutrients, quote-unquote, they needed to buy for real. Via the National Review. And we know that they're honest about everything. Uh, but here's the excerpt. We'll just run through it a little bit here before it's time to check out. It's far from clear haha, whether Ideal Health's, that is, the Trump Network's products, had any substantive nutritional value. I guess that's another one of those uh, side businesses he had, or at least licensed his name to. Take the centerpiece of the program, the Priva test, a urine test that would be that would provide a scientific window into your personal biochemistry, as Trump Network's website advertised. Customers would purchase a Priva, kit, Priva test kit, collect a urine sample, and ship the sample to a lab, which would analyze it and develop a custom essentials kit of nutritional supplements calibrated to reflect your unique nutrient needs. It's not completely off the wall if you don't know anything right? I mean, I don't know. Doctors keep asking me to pee in a cup. There must be some reason for it. Whether or not it tells them what essential nutrients I might be missing or overindulging in, I have no idea. I don't think so. But, yeah, you know, whatever. I mean, but on the other hand, it's easy to see that, no, that's not something you can actually learn from urine. They just, you know, are taking advantage of the fact that you know that urine apparently has some sort of medical value to analysts and we'll just use it in this way and then lo and behold sell you a very expensive package of vitamins well anyway uh let's see to burnish its medical bona fides in its sample in its uh priva test results booklet and it's included in the uh, national review they linked to the pdf the trump network cited a 2002 article in the journal of american medical association that declared it appears prudent for all adults to take vitamin supplements of course it doesn't say anything about peeing in a cup to figure out whether or not you need vitamins or what vitamins you might need well anyway it's all sort of evaluated by a doctor at a uh, website called quack watch which that's got to be legit because it says quack right in it. So those guys are the quacks and we're the smart guys. But uh, yeah, uh, as you might have expected, uh, sounds like the scam. The Priva test and the monthly supply of custom essentials costs about $140. And an additional month supply costs $70 on top of that. And to keep one's unsurpassed individual nutritional support up to date, the Trump Network recommended a repeating, uh, repeating the previous test uh, nine every nine months at a price of a hundred dollars plus shipping and handling. Wow! And of course, Donald Trump uh, cut a video for the Trump Network, not necessarily the little P section of it there, but I don't know, just another weird way to remind you: uh, golden showers, ha ha. P, Donald Trump is a total jerk and uh, should not be sworn in as president. He's compromised and he's a Russian asset. Thank you very much. We'll sign off for the day and hand the reins over to the much more responsible journalists over at the after show who are re reporting, among other things, the following. Trump moves forward with the foreign business deal less than one week after vowing not to do it. The Scottish land deal over there with the golf course, right? Maybe not. We'll find out if there's more. Department of Interior nominees Congressman Ryan Zinke of Montana has a cloudy past when it comes to federal land development and climate change. And I'll squeeze in just a little bit more about the upcoming after show after this. From Daily Coast Radio on NetworksRadio.com. You have been listening to the Kegro in the Morning Show with David Waltman. Well, I'll tell you what I think is the most important part. The after show's last half. Chris Reeves, a.k.a. Tom Servo 433, will be on for news about the DNC Future Forum over this last weekend. And also the nuts and bolts about candidate and press relations, the importance of leadership in the Agriculture Department, and what havoc might education nominee Betsy DeVos exact.